can you tell me, you know, as you arrived at the scene there, what was going through your mind? Well, I, I believe that uh, every one of us, as we got to that scene, uh, we were thinking, it just didn't add up to us how this vehicle gets through, navigates these rock barriers, this fenced off area, the, the gate, and ends up into, into that locks. It's, there's other areas of that roadway where you could see where a vehicle could lose control and go into a ditch, or there's the, uh, the pool just east of the, uh, of the locks where a vehicle would be, make more sense for a vehicle to end up. Uh, so initially, uh, one of the things we we're really thinking of, we have to make sure that, that gate was secure, and that was one of the things that we were focusing on early on. We had some boaters there, we wanted to get uh, their statements, but we, we really wanted to lock down that that gate was locked because that, uh, if that gate was open, it's plausible. That gate is closed and secure, then it becomes much more challenging for that vehicle to end up where it did. Did it take you long to sort of begin to suspect that there may be something? Tell me about a little bit about that. Well, uh, it didn't. It didn't appear to be your your normal accident. You know, we when when I got there, information was we had at least one body in the car, and then of course we come to find out that there was four. But one body in that vehicle. Uh, we had some debris that was located uh, about a hundred meters uh, northeast of the vehicle that didn't seem to directly tie, but the lawn was freshly mowed. So why would that debris be over there? So there's a lot of things that just didn't add up. There was no, uh, no brake marks. If this vehicle was going that way and somebody saw the locks and then panicked, you'd expect to find skid marks or something uh, leading up. So the, the absence of any evasive maneuvers by a vehicle, physical evidence of that, certainly caused us all to have pause and look, I think, even deeper and, and more finer into the crime scene area. When the family arrived, um, was there anything remarkable about their behavior or unremarkable? Well, uh, I was out at the scene and uh, my file manager, Jeff Dempster, was the individual who first dealt with the family. And uh, he indicated to me that in, on the initial reports, the family displayed I guess it's hard to say an appropriate emotion because what's an appropriate emotion when you get notified that a couple of your family members are, are found in a vehicle? Because uh, I believe when he first spoke to him, we confirmed that there was two because the civilian diver said one, possibly two. And uh, so the initial report was it was appropriate uh, emotion from them. Uh, and then we found out that they had stayed at the, the Kingston uh, Mills, uh, sorry, Kingston East Motel. And then we, uh, so we thought, okay, we have the family at the station, we have victims at the, at the locks, and we have this hotel. So now we have to find out what happened. The family's telling us uh, a version of events. Uh, we need to find out if anybody saw this vehicle at the Kingston East Motel, uh, anybody saw these, these individuals leave. So you're trying to figure out what the mindset of these, these victims was just before this accident happened. So you're piecing all these events together. How important was it, though, that in that discussion with Hamed, that uh, it began, it was learned that he had had an accident, um, and, and he reported an accident in Montreal. How crucial was that to the turn in, in, in the way of the investigation? Well, that, that absolutely was crucial, because once uh, we learned that information and we confirmed it with uh, the Montreal police, uh, at that stage, by that evening, we were thinking, okay, we have some pieces at this locks. We have uh, a vehicle that was in Kingston's, not here any longer. And it's quite unusual that you, uh, you lose four of your family members. Uh, your eldest son leaves the city, ends up in Montreal, gets in a single motor vehicle accident in an empty parking lot that the parents allegedly don't know about. It's, it seemed to be an awful lot of coincidences, you know, all these events happening at the same time. So uh, the following day, uh, July 1st, we had uh, Detective Koopman. Uh, he uh, had a, a very long interview with, uh, through a translator with uh, Mohammed Shafia. 
and in that he provided uh, consent to go search his home and when we were there, Detective Koopman located what ended up being crucial pieces of evidence that tied the Lexus to the, uh, the locks. How crucial? Absolutely crucial, you know. Um, as the investigation went on, we, we uncovered lots of other information, wiretaps, uh, cell phone tracking, uh, information from the laptop, but there's always that physical evidence, that, that scientific evidence. So uh, we had uh, our forensic identification officer, Rob Etherington, put those pieces together and uh, did a, a cursory examination, which, uh, which shifted the investigation from uh, a coroner's investigation to a, a homicide investigation. And then those initial uh, findings by him were uh, proven scientifically by the Center of Forensic Sciences. Uh, they were able to say that not only were these pieces from a Lexus, they're from this Lexus, the Lexus owned by the Shafias. So that was, that was very, very big. And I think that's very powerful evidence for the jury because now we know that the vehicle that the eldest son was operating was at that scene where the vehicle was, where the center was found. And then through uh, the Ontario Provincial Police uh, Collision Reconstructionist, Chris Prent, he was able to take the Sentra and the weight, the suspension, uh, all scientifically proven. He's a collision expert. And he's able to say, well, not only was the, the Lexus there, it impacted the Sentra. And because of the design and height of the two vehicles, it impacted it when it was at the locks. So that ties it right to the scene. Within uh, three or four days, actually, the family, the Shafia family, um, had a period of grief, grieving. They, yes. they invited the media in, basically. There was uh, quite, quite a lot of coverage going on at that time. Yes. Describe to me, tell me, what were you and your team doing at that precise time? Well, actually, we had, uh, we had team members that, uh, that remained quite close to the, the family, and, and that was part of our investigative strategy, was to uh, provide, and specifically Detective Koopman was the, the link to the family. and. Uh, that, we utilized that strategy was one we wanted to show that, to make the family think that we're small town cops, that we think this is an accident and we're so much scratching our head, we just can't figure this thing out. And also it was a way for us to kind of track the mindset, specifically of, of Hamid, because he was the one who was talking to us. He, he spoke English, so uh, through his interactions with uh, Detective Koopman, we could kind of keep ties on where they were going. Uh, they, we knew that the family, uh, had the means to uh, get up and leave the country. Uh, they're certainly financially uh, stable. And uh, so we were always mindful of that possibility. We get a phone call uh, through our front desk from a 911 dispatcher of another family member who has concerns about how these girls died. Uh, so, and then we also have the statements or the, the gaps in the statements. We've got a mysterious trip to Montreal. We have pieces of this vehicle. Uh, we have uh, a family that's showing some proper grief, but uh, things just are not consistent. And they're, and they're not being, uh, overwhelming us with information. Uh, there's a lot of details at certain points of their story, and then when we get close to the event, there's some gaps. So if, I guess you'd call it the classic constellation of facts let us to go, we're pretty confident that we're moving into a, a homicide investigation at that point. The intercepts. Yes. Tell me about those. How, how did that come, come to be? How did that idea? Well, uh, the intercepts, I believe it was Detective Dempster, who was the file manager. Uh, we were talking about how we're going to get information from this family. Uh, you discussed various investigative strategies, but a family dynamic, uh, it's very difficult. Like most crimes you, in, you investigate are from a criminal enterprise. It's, you know, it's two individuals, they get a mutual benefit, they get cash, drugs. That's where a lot of the crime is centered around. And of course, uh, or most domestic violence, it's one individual perpetrated against you know, their spouse, that kind of thing. Or familial violence, one particular child. Uh, but when you've got four family members that have been uh, murdered and you have three family members as suspects, you have to figure how can we get inside? How can we get dynamic? 
At the same time, we always have to be mindful of the prosecution in that a wiretap is the most intrusive form of an investigation. So there's very, very strict guidelines on, on when and how you can get them. So you have to make sure you've uh, exhausted all investigative avenues before you go there. We need to dig into their heads. We need to, uh, there's no way that we're going to pull one of them in and interview one and they'll spin and give up the other one. That, we could see that quite quickly. Uh, even, uh, I believe it was uh, Hammond's second interview, he said he would stay all night and talk to us. He just wanted his mom and dad to go home. You know, so uh, we know right there that says that he's an 18 year old who's very protective of his, of his parents. So we, we knew that uh, we'd have to get inside their head and the only way to do that in their mindset was through a wiretap. And, uh, and that's when we got the idea of bringing them back under the guise of giving back some clothing. Uh, and of course we continued our Keystone Cop play and that uh, when they came down they were told they're gonna get the Lexus back and then the officers got berated that they weren't getting the Lexus back and they should be telling the family. So we continued with that theme throughout the investigation. And it worked, I guess. Yes, the, uh, it worked very, very well. They, uh, they came down and, and uh, we were able to install a listening device in their, in their van and, and we went through the locks. And there's two reasons for that. We, uh, we drove them through the route from the hotel to the locks. We wanted to see if uh, retracing those steps would reveal any emotion in them. Uh, and we also wanted to see uh, how they would react if we said if there was a camera there. And, uh, and, we, and we very carefully said, if there was a camera there, and, and then I, I was there with uh, Detective Forbes and Detective Pete, and, and I actually continued this berating my staff because they didn't have that camera information back yet. And uh, it really didn't make any difference to us whether they believed us that the camera was there or not. We just wanted them to have a two or three hour drive back to Montreal and discuss whether the camera was there or not. And that's exactly what they did. It's stunning. It's st stunning revelations that uh, one, that, that you have somebody who's committed this act, and two, even after you're committing this act, you have such anger uh, to, to refer to your daughters as filth and horrors. And it's, it's unimaginable. Like, we just, none, none of us could fathom it. You know, most of us in the room were, were parents, and how do you get your head around? Anybody saying that? What does that, what could anyone have done? What could a, a teenage girl, what could a first wife have done to possibly warrant such vile comments?